At his peak, the American novelist Mark Twain was said to write at a rate of 1,800 words a day. That's way more than Hemingway at 500, but less than Stephen King at 2,000 words a day. But can we really believe the man, yes, it was Mark Twain, who said there are lies, damn lies and statistics. The phrase warns against the temptation of using statistics to bolster weak arguments, which is helpful because 29% of people in a recent survey believed it was Disraeli who came up with the phrase, not Mark Twain. But context and timing is everything for statistics. Modern life is framed by them. Cases per thousand during the pandemic, figures for inflation or economic growth during recession, or the diminishing chances of our favourite team winning the premiership as the season comes to a close. Over the decades, what would we in the social sciences have done without being able to approach people at a bus stop, on the phone, or on their doorstep, armed only with a pen and a clipboard? Listening to Professor Ian Diamond, the UK's national statistician, you start to realise just how far things have come. Now we have the tools to capture 24-7 how people behave. And we can do it at extraordinary speed and in great detail. I'm passionate about numbers and statistics like this from 6 in the morning till 10 at night. It's fantastically interesting, but at the same time, quite a responsibility. because It's a hell of a responsibility. Yeah, throwing some numbers over the wall and hoping that someone catches them is not what we should be doing. The we society is exactly what we, as a society, should be together trying to achieve. That's Professor Ian Diamond crunching the numbers with me, Will Hutton, on The We Society, brought to you by the Academy of Social Sciences. This week I'm speaking to Professor Sir Ian Diamond, whose official title is National Statistician for the UK. Through his work, Ian has an unequalled view of what the nation's thinking and doing. He knows when the UK is in trouble and prospering, long before journalists think tanks or politicians. I think that's pretty exciting. Welcome, Ian, and thanks for joining us on The We Society. Well, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. When I invited you to come on, uh, this podcast series called The We Society, what was the first thing that came into your mind? How, what thought process did it trigger, We Society? Well, it triggered a thought process which said, isn't this absolutely what society is about? We. We as a community, a set of communities, a set of governance structures working together to build a life of prosperity and happiness and well-being for every citizen in our country. The WE Society is exactly what we, as a society, should be together trying to achieve. Now, National Statistician, the UK's National Statistician, how does that inform your position in that role? Well, as UK national statistician, I'm in a very, very, very privileged position. Our job is to provide statistics and evidence on all matters of society, the economy, and indeed now the environment uh, as well. It's fantastically interesting, but at the same time, quite a responsibility. Because it's a hell of a responsibility. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, week in, week out, there are new important statistics, whether it is on inflation, whether it is on the extent of the economy, or whether it is on the level of COVID, or on life expectancy, well-being. It's interesting that you've, alongside kind of hard data about the what, you've decided to kind of add how we are interpreting the what. When you think of all this data, you're putting it, there you are, putting it out week in, week out, fantastic numbers. I mean, are we using it well enough? Um, what drives you? What, what makes you get up out of bed in the morning and think, what's, I, you know, what's going on here? What's, you know, what's, what's propelling you? What's animating you? Well, what really animates me is the way in which data properly presented, and I use that really, really seriously because I do believe our data should be accessible to every citizen, and so we have a responsibility to present our data in an accessible way. But our data should be presented in a way not only that is accessible, but which is interpretable. So just, you know, throwing 
uh, shall I say metaphorically, some numbers over the wall and hoping that someone catches them is not what we should be doing. The statistician says, you know, because if we do not interpret our data, then people will say, well, OK, that's a number, but what does it mean for me? And increasingly, we're looking at an awful lot of numbers which people really actually impact on people's lives and they need to know what it is. And at the same time, we should be providing data for government, which is enabling government to make the very difficult decisions that government makes, which impact positively on every citizen's uh, life. Now, Will, at the, the, one of the key things of the last uh, couple of years has been the existence of dashboards. Now, I'm very excited about dashboards because they provide a way of communicating data. But if we're not careful, we end up with data deluge. And it is so important, Will, that as the Office for National Statistics, we are not just providing data which becomes a deluge of numbers. Instead, what we are doing is providing insight. And that means, to come back to the we society, we are not, again, just locked up in our offices in Newport or in Titchfield or in Darlington, putting some numbers that we are conversing with citizens, conversing with governments, conversing with the voluntary sector about how the data should be, what are the big questions, and then we are providing numbers which inform them. And if that will doesn't get you out of bed in the morning, then nothing is going to get you out of bed in the morning. I love your passion. I mean, I, a statistician who's this passionate is kind of almost a contradiction in terms, you know. I, thinking back to Monty Python sketches 50 years ago, what they would say about statistics, but not with Serian. The levels of trust in the ONS, extraordinarily high. We are so proud about that. We are very, very, very conscious that trust is incredibly important. And we believe passionately in, if you like, what Honora O'Neill would say, is not that we should expect the people famous, to trust uh, us. The famous Cambridge-based philosopher, the very fam- ethics, yeah, yeah. gave the Ruth lectures. That, that, exactly. Yeah. And what Honora, I think, would say was we should not expect people to trust us. We should prove that we are trustworthy. And that is something that we are very, we have at the heart of everything that we do, that our numbers should have accuracy, they should be how we've calculated them, our working should be transparent, and that we should work, as I've already said, to communicate them in an accessible way. And I'm so delighted, periodically, uh, every couple of years, we do an independent survey of public trust in official statistics. We don't do it. It's done independently by uh, another organisation. And we've just got the results and they show trust in official statistics and in the ONS at an all-time high. And that all-time high, uh, at around 90%, is very high. It's very high. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of... Uh... Uh, any institution or any organisation that goes higher than 90. I can't think of one. Mm. But look, I mean, I think you earned that to a degree uh, during the COVID crisis. I mean, the whole thing, uh, the speed with which you would put numbers out of the public domain, the speed with which you kind of were able to monitor the incidence of the disease and where it was prevalent and, and its transparent kind of impact on policy... Uh, and the way in which it was behind kind of all those presentations from Sir Patrick Valance and Sir Chris Whitty, you know, and yourself, of course. I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you, had your, you had your moments in the sunshine as well. I mean, looking back on that, what were you proudest of? And what if you could live your life again? You, would you do differently? I mean, I'm, I'm, pr- I'm incredibly proud of the way in which every one of my colleagues who was ever asked to do something at pace, to deliver, didn't think about it, just said yes. That's the proudest thing. We, as an organisation, had the opportunity at a moment in time, which was difficult for our country, to step up and to provide information. I did want to say, though, that you can only impact on policy if the policymakers want to 
receive your numbers and to act on them. And I do think the government has been brilliant at saying what are the numbers saying and listening to the way in which the numbers have gone before making difficult policy decisions. Our job is not to make policy, our job is to inform that. And, and I, I really I have been impressed with that. If I was asked about one or two particular points, the large COVID infection survey that we now have, we put together at a time when you may recall that the testing regime was under pressure. We didn't know an enormous amount about the level of positivity in the country, and we needed to. And that we were able, sometimes official statisticians will suggest that they're fairly dusty people and it takes a bit of time for them to uh, get to do anything. We went from a conversation about needing this on a Thursday to designing things, getting two ethical committees to approve what we wanted to do, getting the field work set up and being in the field in seven days. And I just think that shows absolutely what you can do. But it wasn't also um, just about monitoring the pandemic. At the same time, as we know, the government took a lot of very big decisions which were always going to impact on our economy. No question. Every country, yeah, yeah. every country's economy was impacted. In taking those decisions, the government didn't need a three-month look back at what was happening three months ago. They needed to know what was happening this week, what's happening now. Just give us a little detail of that survey. What was it actually? Yeah, a little bit about the survey. What we did was say, right, we need three things. We need to know what is the level of pos positivity in the country. So let's do a large survey, which can give regional estimates by age uh, and by sex of the level of positivity. So that meant going to households and getting a test done in the households and getting that at pace to a laboratory to test for positivity. Secondly, we wanted to know about whether there were trends of uh, transformation within a household. So we sampled households and took swabs from everybody over the age of two in that household. And thirdly, we wanted to know about the level of antibodies in the population. And so from a large subsample, we took some blood. I would say also we asked some questions and some questions which became increasingly important over time. For example, questions about fatigue, uh, which enabled us to inform long COVID. And finally, we asked those questions over time. We went back to the same households so that we could look at reinfections, so that we look, could look at length of infection. All those things had never been done before and haven't been done in any other country. Indeed, some countries have been to see us to say, look, we want to learn about how you did this uh, so that we can think ourselves. And I think finally, the long term opportunity here is that we will have the platform for a major public health survey, which we can bolt on other questions about public health. And were we to find ourselves in another challenging situation, we could surge it up very, very quickly in a way that would mean that unlike the last pandemic, we were ready with the data right up front. I do sometimes think that, um, you know, if I hear uh, another cabinet minister boasting about Britain being world beating and leading the world, uh, I think I'm going to scream. But on this collection of the data, the vaccine and the relative of the vaccine and the kind of uh, intelligence with which it was all mounted was world beating. I mean, I think the rollout of the vaccines was brilliant. I would also say that I think an enormous amount of very good data uh, ever was done to provide really um, speedy data on vaccinations. And we have been able to link those vaccine data with the infection survey and also sometimes with census data in order to be able to understand where um, the vaccines were, where most uptake was, and, and hence a, uh, to be able to inform potential policy to make the 
policy around communications on the vaccines very, very appropriate to different communities in our society. And I think, uh, and I see what you think, that that's been... Uh, of course, there's been an anti-vaxxer kind of movement in the UK that is kind of across Western Europe and in North America. But actually, the number of refuseniks is quite low, even within some ethnic minorities where it's poorer than the British white population. You could argue that actually the high levels of trust in our numbers, people recognising that actually vaccination worked, was very persuasive and actually saying, I'll step up to be vaccinated. Well, I think that I, I think being able to have really accurate data from our survey, as well as from the great things that UK Health Security Agency do, on the, the the way in which vaccines work and the length of time before you get waning, um, has been really, really important in informing people. And then I think the communications by um, the different communications people, particularly government communication service, has been outstanding to say we are not, we are a we society but we are a we society made up of different communities and you need to target your communications in a way which is appropriate to different parts of our society. And that has, I think, led over time to the really good uptakes. Before we carry on the conversation, just a quick word about the organisation behind the podcast series. The Academy of Social Sciences is a national body established in 1982. It's for academics, practitioners and learned societies in the social sciences. As the leading independent voice in the UK, it champions the vital role social sciences play in education, in government and in business. What is that role? Well, social sciences help us to understand the human world. That means solving grand challenges like climate change, wealth creation or energy crises. It might mean working out the practicalities of levelling up the regions of Britain, monitoring happiness, maintaining standards of education, or addressing racial equality. Or it could be providing vital context for issues affecting public health, or working out a better way for our cities to be designed and planned. You can find out more about the Academy of Social Sciences' work by going to the website acss.org.uk. That's acss.org.uk. Or you can follow us on Twitter at ACAD Sock Sciences. You'll find those details in our show notes. So, back to the conversation. It's a wee society, but some of the class divisions and experience divisions um, of the disease and having long COVID, which is also kind of dramatic, has varied a lot. You know, if you're a professional, if you're in the top kind of decimal income distribution, you know, frankly um not sailed through this but it's not been it's been discomforting but it hasn't been it hasn't been as kind of dramatic as it been for the bottom two, couple of deciles particularly those who live in multi-occupation houses now you know all the data you, yeah i mean i think it's, I, look throughout my career i have been aware of and looked at the numbers of the social gradients that we see in our society on just about every health indicator that exists. And we cannot hide from the fact that those people amongst the more disadvantaged members of our society are those for whom the impact of COVID has been the greatest. There's no question about that. Uh, and there are all kinds of reasons. You've, um, Will, highlighted one but equally, I think there are more. And I think it is also interesting... Well, diet, I guess. And... Well, I think there are some things. I mean, for example, there is a lot of debate in society about working from home. Yeah. We, one of the things that we also did was we set up an opinion survey at the beginning of the pandemic, a weekly opinion survey, a weekly opinion survey where we went out to a representative sample of the population on a Wednesday, asked them to respond by... Monday, we closed the survey at 4 a.m. on a Monday and published at midday. Again, at pace, really important stuff. And one of the things that stayed constant, many things have changed over time. People's anxiety has changed over time. People's um, belief in meeting other people has changed over time. But one of the things that hasn't changed over time, almost a flat line, 
is the proportion of people who report having worked from home in the last seven at some time in the last seven days. Now, if you then take, if you like, the social characteristics of those people who report they've been able to work from home, service sector professional, hundred percent. Whereas those yep. people who've got yep. to be yep. out, it absolutely uh, is the case that you've got that gradient. And at times, you know, when at the end of the day, you've got to go out and meet someone in order to get transmission. And if you are having to go out and meet people, you are likely to have a higher probability of transmission. Uh, and I would also say that, as Chris Whitty has um, observed, if we look at a, the geographical distribution of where the highest rates of um, COVID have been during some of the higher waves, and then you looked at another indicator, let's just say the one Chris pointed out to once was um, infant mortality in the 19th century. It's almost. I know. It's it's, it's almost know, a very similar geographical distribution. I know. So, so you, uh, pen the. You know, smaller towns either side of the Pennines, you know. You're absolutely right. Industrial mid smaller towns, industrial midlands. I know it's, yeah. it's desperate, isn't it? I mean, and uh, so that's where I think you know we are we recognising that is why we have to use this dreadful pandemic as if you like a call to arms to say, okay, now what's the next stage of how we really improve and make policy and um, to to enable people to take decisions to improve their well-being and their health because that's what we have to do now leveling up i mean the white paper has its critics but what is amazing is the stats i mean life expectancy is one obvious one obesity is another uh, uh, travel to work times in some towns in the north of england compared to travel to work times in in london and so on and so on and so on and you read this page after page after page of stats and at the end of it you just think this cannot be allowed to continue. This degree of equity in our country cannot be allowed to continue. I agree. Uh, look, um, I do think that Andy Haldane and the team at the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities did a fantastic job. Um, and we were very privileged to work with them to help with some of the numbers. And the message is absolutely clear. And it's a message that some of us have been um, talking about for a very long time um, and we you know I don't think anyone would say we can allow this to continue we must not allow this to con continue we've now got the evidence base to move forward what we now need to do is multifold I would argue and the first thing I would say from not just the data but everything in the, the leveling up white paper is that there's no magic bullet here. You're not going to say... No, you have to agree. No, I agree yeah, with you. So Actually, just give our listeners... I mean, I just think it's... I've got, I'm sitting here, the National Statistician, and I'd like you just give me some of the numbers that you think are kind of illuminate this point most vividly. OK, well, I'll, I'll give you one, which comes from Scotland, actually. So, and from um, a regional public health um, report that I saw a couple of years ago. And it just shocked me. The difference in life expectancy in two electoral wards of Aberdeen that were about three miles apart was 16 years. One, six. I mean, that, that's just astonishing. What accounts for it? I mean, if you had to put your statistical hat on, what are the, when you look at the, what are the kind of top three reasons for that? Well, I think I'd say lifestyle. you yeah, absolutely clear. Uh, I think if Michael Marmot were here, his evidence would also add wealth uh, uh, and, if you like, poverty uh, to that. And the the third one... Um, if, what if way you, does wealth make you live longer? Well, wealth enables you access to all kinds of things which uh, enable you to be able to take decisions which enable you to live a healthier life. And the final one, which I think is absolutely critical and comes, and probably if, you know, I, I've said earlier, there's no magic bullet. Well, I think there is one bullet that is probably, I would argue, and I've always said this more than anyone, that's education. Top line education for everybody to equal up the opportunities that people have 
and that we have opportunities for people to grow at different paces and maybe to, you know, maybe for some people going into FE college and then going on or, or stopping then in, with a set of skills is absolutely critical. And I think we really do have to think through very quickly our education system, investing in early yep. years, in making sure we equal up across the school thing and the school system and having really good um, advice for people about the pathways they can follow through FE or HE afterwards and the way in which we have at a local level integrated systems of FE and HE seem to me to be absolutely critical things that we need to work for. That's not the only magic bullet but you're asking me what the most important things are. That's to me one of them. And I often think about education is that, you know, it's characterized as, you know, you, it's going to be good for productivity. It's going to be good for skills. And of course, that's true. But actually, there's some, there's some very simple reasons, I think, why uh, it, when I'm sitting in front of a doctor and I'm trying to explain to her, you know, what it is that's making me ill, you know, you need to be able to find the right words. You need to be articulate. You need to be able to express yourself exactly. so that she can get a handle on what it is you're suffering from. Yeah. And make so you know, the, and diagnostics in medicine and being able to and for a doctor to quickly get to the bottom of what a patient kind of uh, is suffering from requires a level of exchange, empathy from the doctor, and ability by the patient to express themselves. And educated people can do that better. 100%. You get educated not just because you're going to be skilled and all the rest of it, but you get better for... It, it's Every dimension of your life is kind of uh, radically improved by education. A statistic I always um, come back to, which is not for our country, is wonderful work by uh, the British demographer um, John Cleland and the Dutch demographer Jerome Van Hineken. Working in India, they showed that every extra year of education a woman had was associated with a 3 per thousand reduction in infant mortality. Yeah. You know, which is absolutely significant. And just just those things, you know, the education plays an enormous role over and above. You know, you, you know me, I love the idea that everybody in our society ought to be able to solve a simultaneous equation and speak a modern language and all those kind of things. But being able to do that is part of a set of skills which if you like are the building blocks to being a serious seriously engaging in the we society in a way that enables you to be able to have the empowerment to deal with other parts of the we society in a way that is going to impact positively on your well-being and on your prosperity and on your productivity when you look at all the statistics that you monitor i mean my god there's so many i mean I, you know just leafing through the scope of what you do in your mind across a month what's the most salient statistics that you release it's really really interesting question you know because let's look at the moment you know probably the biggest number or the biggest you know excitement at the moment is what we're saying about inflation Absolutely. on a monthly basis. Two years ago, it would have been something to do with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, at other times, you know, it has been um, things to do with, shall we say, historically, baby names. Now, that's therefore something where we recognise that at different times, different things will be important because what is going on it's not our job to we don't impact on the Fair economy enough. we record what is going on you have this bird's eye view of what's going on and and you're feeding us data and there's these stats into the machine but i mean you uh our capacity as a uh as a society both in the private and the public sector to kind of anticipate and plan for these things that you're identifying is not great is it or it's great maybe it's getting a bit better I think it's improving one of the things we've been really 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 keen on ensuring is that we are talking to policy makers and we are talking to people like yourself all the time and we are saying look you've got to be prepared to ask questions Someone could say to you, Ian, tell me something interesting about the labour force. 
And I could say, well, I find it pretty interesting that there are now, I don't know, you know, 25,000 football coaches in this country. But that's not perhaps very useful in making... Because you're a referee, aren't you? You're a football referee. I, I, I do a little football <laughs> refereeing, which I actually enjoy. Um, but So I'd have to say, instead, we have really put effort into saying to people, no, telling me, asking me to tell you something interesting is not useful. It comes back to my point about insight. What are the real questions that you need an answer to? And I think increasingly we are getting the capacity, uh, both amongst our politicians and amongst uh, our civil servants and amongst other areas of our we society, to ask important questions. Certainly we've had some very good conversations recently uh, with people in the voluntary sector, with organisations in the voluntary sector, about, OK, you know, you're working uh, in a particular area. Uh, what are the questions you need to answered because we're trying to answer some of these questions but we need to make sure that we're answering them in let a me, useful way. Let me way. ask you a question. I mean just I think people in their minds say the obvious financial statistics kind of you know uh, kind of jury people kind of going into their desks but it's, so you make it come alive. You know, well, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. You know, we are look we have we are full of people who are passionate about what they do who are deeply committed to being agile. We have four pillars to our um, strategy. We want radical statistics. We are ambitious in wanting to be really engaged with all of our we society. We are sustainable and we are inclusive. And that inclusive is a really central part that we haven't really talked about, Will, but perhaps another time. But it is about something that I'm personally passionate about. And I've, if you said one of my bit, I've really driven is with real support from some of my colleagues that every citizen in our country should have a voice in our data. And how important in a we society is it that our statistics reflect the voice of every member of our society and then we are able to really talk about producing statistics which reflect our society and producing them in a way which can impact positively on the lives of every citizen. In the space of a kind of short time, we've covered incredible ground. I mean, we've heard about your passion for statistics. We've heard about this, uh, the structure of the kind of organization you'd lead and its integrity. We've discussed uh, the, the rapidity with which uh, you were able to get data collection up and running during the COVID crisis and how that's spilling over into kind of just-in-time collection of statistics. We've, you've discussed uh, the cost living crisis. All in all, uh, it's been a fascinating, fascinating kind of conversation. But oh, no, thank well, you. it's been an enormous pleasure to have had this opportunity. Thank you for listening to The We Society. It's brought to you by the Academy of Social Sciences, acss.org.uk. I'm Will Hutton, the producer is Emily Finch, and it's a Whistledown production.